U.S. Department of Energy's Oak Ridge Reservation is the site of a vital national defense facility and a modern computational and scientific center. But over the years, parts of the reservation have been contaminated with radioactive and other hazardous waste. DOE has been busy cleaning up those affected areas, but much remains to be done. Citizen input is a valuable part of that effort, and DOE welcomes advice from the Oak Ridge Site-Specific Advisory Board, a citizens panel that provides independent advice and recommendations on DOE's cleanup of the Oak Ridge Reservation. The board provides input on a wide range of environmental cleanup operations underway at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Y-12 National Security Complex, and the East Tennessee Technology Park. You can be part of this important work by attending the monthly meetings of the Oak Ridge Site-Specific Advisory Board. For more information, call or visit our website. <clears throat> Thanks everybody for being here this evening. Um, we've got a good presentation on deck tonight, but before we get started, I'd like to ask for comments from our federal and state agency reps. Dave Adler, anything from you? A lot. Um, there is a, something I want to make sure people are aware of. On February 27th, we'll be having having the public opening. I'm sorry, Febru February 27th, we'll be having the public opening of the History Center out at the K-25 site. I got to tour it uh, while it was being finished up a few days ago, and it's really I was really surprised at how much I enjoyed going through it and how, how, how meaningful an experience, frankly, it was to see what took place out there. So I really encourage people to check it out. Tell your friends to check it out. It's free. It um, doesn't take long to go through it. I, I probably would want to go back a couple times to actually read all the things. But I want people to be aware that that's happening on the 27th. You'll also see <clears throat> in the next couple of weeks, they're going to begin tearing down s significant components of the centrifuge complex, the large white buildings right there by the highway. And that's really the, depending on how you rank buildings, it's the last large complex to come down. There's also the 1600 complex, which is in the center of the U. But it'll be a very visible skyline change because everybody coming into Oak Ridge will no longer see that. They'll just see the ridge behind it. So it's kind of a milestone for us. Um, aside from that, we've got a couple of special guests from EPA that I'll let Connie introduce. We're pleased that they drove up here for us. And that's, that's all I've got for now. Thank Thanks. you, Dave. Ms. Connie. Thank you. Um, I don't know if those were familiar with our former division director, Franklin Hill. He retired the end of December. We have an entire new management chain um, within EPA, the Superfund and Emergency Management Division. That new director is Carol Monell. And um, we have a new branch chief. His name is Glenn Adams. He used to be over our what we call Superfund Support Section, toxicologist, risk assessor, he has that background. And my immediate supervisor is Kathy Amoroso. She is my new section chief. So um, we had a tour at ETTP today. Uh, and I don't want to forget, I have Craig Van Treese. He's one of our newest RPMs. And he's working with Carl Frody and myself at ETTP in terms of cleanup projects. We took a tour today. And I've been working at ETTP for EPA since 1998. I have no reference other than the buildings that Dave mentioned. The entire skyline has changed. For those that may have worked out there, you would not know the, the place as it is now. There's, I would get lost, but uh, there's a lot of work going on, and UCOR has a, um, uh, a mission to have all the buildings down this year, and I think that they're going to meet that. So I don't have anything else to say, but I'd be willing to attempt to answer questions if asked. Wonderful. Thank you. Ian Kristoff. Good evening. Um, I do not have an announcement. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. I'm going to hand things over to Leon. <clears throat> I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, be Mr. Jim Bolin is the president of Isotec uh, Systems, the U United States Department of Energy's contractor responsible for disposing of uranium-233 stored at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. He is a versatile uh, executive with more than 40 years of experience in operations, program, and project management with the Department of Energy contractors, private industry, and the U United States Navy. He previously served as the Engineering, Procurement, and Construction Director for USEC Incorporated. 
American Centrifuge Plan in Piketon, Ohio, and he has held the leadership positions with several other companies, including uh, serving as a deputy facilities manager and a project manager at Y12 for Lockheed Martin Energy Systems. Uh, Mr. Boland holds a Bachelor of Science in Nuclear Engineering and a Master of Engineering in Nuclear in Engineering, both from Pennsylvania uh, State University. Mr. Boland. Thank you, I'm uh, pleased to be here. And I'm also a UT grad, <laughs> I'll point that. Um, I'm absolutely uh, thrilled to be here to talk about Isotech. I would like to introduce my deputy project manager, Sarah Schaefer, who's been at Isotech working uh, with us for since 2008, so I'm, uh, I'm delighted. Um, there's a basket uh, by the uh, um, cooler, and it's got a variety of different colored uh, cancer uh, bracelets, and they're engraved, no one, uh, no one fights alone. And there's a, a, a placard there that says what the different colors mean. Lavender is the color for all cancers. And so you may wonder, you may think it odd that uh, the contractor whose task is to get rid of uranium-233 and put building 3019 into stable condition for ultimate D&D &D is talking about cancer bracelets and, and no one fights alone. You'll notice that uh, on our logo, we have embedded the lavender ribbon. And, and so when I talk about what we're doing, we at Isotech have had an, an extraordinarily rare opportunity to couple the mission of getting rid of Cold War legacy material and at the same time saving a rare man-made isotope that will have a future for cancer treatment. And so I'll talk about that. So it's pretty exciting for us. So I thought, you know, get the opportunity. The last time I think I was here was back when, when things were changing a bit. It was probably in the time frame of about 2011, and the federal project director was John Kruger. So just uh, for those of you that uh, are probably new to all this, I thought I'd tell you who is Isotech, where are we, what is our job, and, and what are we currently doing out there. So our, our task, as I said, is to dispose of uranium-233. It's a man-made uh, isotope. Way back in uh, the 50s, the scientists were worried that we might run out of uranium-235. And so there was an effort. The government probably spent billions of dollars for the manufacture uh, of U-233. And over the decades of the 50s and 60s, there was a look and ultimately a determination that, well, maybe we really don't need the uranium-233. They, they had some difficulties with it in the course of its manufacture and the reactors. It drags along some other isotopes that make it a bit difficult to handle. And so in, in the early 60s, the government determined that the material should be stored in Building 3019 at Oak Ridge National Lab. So who is Isotech? We're an unpopulated LLC. That means all of our folks are employees of our parent company or subcontractors that work for us. Uh, we've, we, our parent company is Atkins Nuclear Secured here in Oak Ridge, and they are part of SNC-Lavalin, a Canadian engineering and construction company. Um, up to about four years ago, we were owned or a subsidiary of uh, Energy Solutions, and uh, then Atkins, who was an engineering firm over in England, decided they wanted to buy the federal service part of Energy Solutions, so we got acquired in that. And not, on, not but a year later, SNC-Lavalin said, we want to buy all of Atkins. So we're owned by a foreign company, uh, and that's OK. We have about 180 people uh, at Isotech, and uh, we are at a variety of facilities, as you see listed there. And I'll show you a map then when it shows up. So Isotech is, uh, has been noted. We've had the, uh, were awarded the contract back in October of 2003. Uh, over the original mission was actually to extract uh, uh, thorium-229 from the uranium inventory and actually go forward and manufacture uh, or pull off the medical isotope actinium-225. However, in the fall of 2005, Congress said, no, we don't know that there's a market for that, and they changed the mission and moved the mission from under uh, uh, nuclear energy over to environmental management. And so in that time frame, the task was dispose of all uranium-233 that's stored out there and stabilize the facility. Uh, we proceeded down that path, and then in 2011, 
there was an evaluation done being looked at the whole method of disposing of the material, and it was determined that about half of the inventory could be removed from the storage tube vaults and directly disposed either for future program use or uh, for burial. And in fact, uh, that's uh, what we proceeded to do. Our contract is now a fixed price contract. It's been a fixed price contract since January of 2012. We have options in that contract, as you see up here. We completed the planning and design option. We've completed the direct disposition option, and now we're, we're ambitiously working on the processing option and the contract to go take care of the materials. The inventory started out with the 1,098 canisters stored in the storage tube vaults, and as you can see from the photo up there in the description, it was really a very mixed bag of uranium-233. It consists of everything from cans of oxide powder, which is AB powder-like or talcum powder-like in consistency, to pieces of metal, to ceramic monoliths, to uh, including sodium fluoride traps from the molten salt reactor. And so it was a, a very mixed bag. <clears throat> However, it was identified about half of that inventory we could, we could take care of. And so part of it included what are known up here as zero power reactor plates. And, and the Department of Energy and NNSA have determined that there's a future use for those plates. And they've never, they were used for criticality studies, but have never been used. So we actually packaged those up and shipped those out. And they're being stored at a device assembly facility in Nevada for future program use. They've been tr turned over, transferred to NNSA. So we reduced that material. Then the CUSP that you see, uh, we directly disposed. CUSP stands for Consolidated Edison Uranium Solidification Project. When the material was originally brought into uh, 3019 in the 60s, there were many gallons of urinal nitrate sitting there. And ultimately, it was determined that was the most stable form. In the 80s, that was converted into the ceramic monolith that was highly radioactive. Uh, it, it contained a substantial amount of uranium-232, and so the dose on these cusp canisters ex was on the order of 150 rem per hour. We've directly taken those out of the vaults and, and in a Type B shipping uh, cask have shipped them out to Nevada, and they're buried under many, many feet of the Nevada desert at NNSS. So that, and then additionally, we've transferred about 15 canisters of very pure U-233 to Oak Ridge National Lab for future studies and use and, and their work. And so that constitutes getting rid of approximately half of the inventory. That still leaves us with over 500 canisters of material to dispose. That includes, as I've mentioned, oxide powders, metal, salts, uh, and other miscellaneous items. So where are we? Uh, the two nuclear facilities that we have custody of and take care of and maintain for uh, uh, DOE include building 3019 and building 2026, and I'll talk a little bit about those. We additionally have our people in uh, uh, facilities 3017, which was a laboratory facilities built in the 50s. It's it got office space now. Uh, we also have another facility 3137 that has offices, as well as building 2040. And for those that are familiar with the lab, you might know it as the protoserve building out there. And then lastly, we're at 701 Scarborough, an office space there. So building 3019, that's where all the U-233 is stored, but it didn't start out its life that way. It was part of the Manhattan Project. Uh, when the folks built it back in 1943 and put it into operation, little did they think it might still be in operation today. Uh, it started out as the, the facility to pilot the various radiochemical processes with nuclear materials. And so in, in, the, in the Manhattan Project days, they would take the radiated fuel slugs out of the, out of the graphite reactor, bring them over into uh, 3019, and it was there that they piloted the process to extract the plutonium out of the uh, uh, fuel slugs. And then that, that set forth the, the processes to go into full-scale production for uh, plutonium at Hanford, for example. So 40s, 50s, and early 60s, uh, the, the main role of 3019 was uh, working on different radiochemical processing of materials. And again, it became the repository in the early 60s for all the U-233. 
And U-233 has to be treated, treated with the same security levels as they would treat highly enriched U-235. So if you look at the footprint, if you walked around Building 3019, and, and when those of you that are coming on the tour on uh, Friday, you will see some similar security measures that you might see at Y-12, or sort of a mini Y-12, uh, and providing the necessary protection for this material. The other facility that we have is Building 2026, and it's a hot cell facility. It has six hot cells in it. It was built in, in uh, 1964, and it did a lot of work with looking at spent fuel, uh, dealing with highly radioactive materials, and, and thus the hot cells are ideal for us for dealing with still our highly radioactive uh, uh, components of the U-233 inventory. We have some components that might have a dose on the order of 3 R per hour, 3 rem per hour, and then we have other components we still have to process that have to be done in a hot cell because they have doses on the order of 70 to 100 R per hour. And so all of that has to be done remotely to get it down to a stable, low-level waste form that we will ultimately ship out for burial. I'll talk about this. So th this is where the cancer part comes in. It's pretty, pretty um, interesting. Uh, several years ago, a, a firm uh, by the name of TerraPower uh, approached the Department of Energy, and, and they were curious on what is the cost to extract this rare thorium-229 that is sitting in our U-233 uranium-233 inventory. And so we, Isotech, were tasked to go look at that. At that time, our job was strictly to ultimately process all the material for safe disposal in, at NNSS. We did an analysis, provided the number which the department provided to TerraPower, and in the course of follow-on discussions, there was an agreement reached that TerraPower said, we'd be willing to cover that cost and then some. And, and so through a lot of dialogue, negotiations, and arrangements, a unique uh, private-public partnership was formed, and it's between TerraPower and Isotech, but it obviously, obviously has the backing of DOE. But under this arrangement, we're extracting the thorium-229, and, and we're providing, we're selling that to TerraPower. In return for the funds that TerraPower pays for it, they pay it to us, Isotech, and so some of that money covers the cost of extracting the thorium, because that's not part of our original work scope. The balance of it is able to apply towards the cost of processing the uranium-233. And so that feature, coupled with it allowed us to accelerate our overall processing schedule, we were able to bring back to the government a benefit and a savings on the order of 90 to $100 million and accelerate the processing and, and disposal of U-233 in the inventory. And recover this rare isotope that we'll talk a little bit more about. So what's Isotech's part? So we've got an early jump on it, and we're doing the initial processing in glove boxes. And so to give you an overview of what the process looks like, I'd like to play this video. You've been hearing all about glove boxes lately, but what exactly are they? Well, the glove boxes are the heart of the Thorium Express. It's where the thorium will be extracted from uranium. And this is how it's done. There are three glove boxes, all connected to each other. Uranium is delivered to glove box one and divided into samples. Then a sample is moved to glove box two. There, uranium is poured into the dissolution beaker and mixed with nitric acid. This creates uranyl nitrate with bits of thorium and plutonium inside. After everything mixes, the solution is then pumped into a feed flask. From there, the solution is pumped into the first column, the transuranic column. This column contains extraction resin that plutonium is highly attracted to. The same way static electricity can cause styrofoam peanuts to stick to a cat's fur, the extraction resin causes plutonium to stick to it as the solution passes through the column. This leaves only uranyl nitrate and thorium left in the solution. To get the thorium out of the solution, it's put through another column, conveniently named the thorium column. The same extraction resin is in this column, and it's also attractive to thorium, just not as much though. So the solution is pumped slower through this one, about six times as slow as it was pumped through the previous column. Thorium couldn't stick to anything previously because the solution was being pumped too fast, but this time, it has plenty of time to stick to the extraction resin. After the solution is done passing through the column, uranyl nitrate is the only thing left. 
so it's pumped into a reservoir that will be put into a grout drum for disposal. Now we have our thorium, but it's still stuck to the resin. Won't do much good there, right? To get the thorium off the resin, a lower concentration nitric acid is pumped through the thorium column. The lower concentration has properties that will ground the ionic charge on the thorium and release it from the resin, creating a new solution of nitric acid and thorium. Now onto glove box three. The nitric acid and thorium solution is put into a thorium product bottle and run through an evaporator held over a water bath. The nitric acid evaporates away, leaving just the thorium left in the container. Now we have our final product, about 70 milligrams of thorium ready to be shipped out to revolutionize the fight against cancer. I know what you're thinking. All that for 70 milligrams? Well, think about it like this. A nanogram of thorium, a millionth of a milligram, has more than 100 times as many atoms as there are cells in the human body. So 70 milligrams is a really gargantuan amount of thorium and will go a long way towards helping in cancer treatments. So that's Isotec's part. We are extracting the thorium. Now, <clears throat> uh, Oak Ridge National Lab extracted some thorium from the stock back in the 90s. They extracted a quarter of a gram of the thorium. And with that, they then generate an isotope of actinium-225 that is being used by medical researchers to look at cancer treatments. One of those cancer treatments is called targeted alpha therapy. What TerraPower has come, had come to the department and said, if we can have all the thorium-229, if we can afford to buy it, we believe that we can ultimately create enough doses for the medical researchers to make targeted alpha therapy a, an FDA-approved cancer treatment. The clinical studies, and I've seen some of them, and I'm certainly not a, a doctor or an expert in this field, but the clinical studies seem to show great promise for targeted alpha therapy in treating prostate and bone cancer and some other cancers. Currently, when the Oak Ridge Lab is able to generate about 4,000 doses of actinium-225 a year for the researchers. Ultimately, when TerraPower has all of the thorium that comes from our stock, they expect to be able to generate upwards of 500,000 doses or more a year for, for cancer treatment. And so they have a plan and they're starting out, they're building a facility in Everett, Washington, an isotope generator facility, where they'll take our thorium-229 and pull off the actinium-225 that occurs through the decay of thorium-229. They'll pull that off and make that available to researchers. Their plan is to ramp up and start getting enough doses that they can keep moving further forward with all their clinical studies and ultimately try and to get FDA approval. And so... TerraPower's part is on the receipt end where they receive the thorium-229 and ultimately convert that into actinium-225 for treatments. This is a short clip from TerraPower about their role. Nuclear innovation. nuclear innovation is a way of looking at the world. Beyond clean energy, nuclear science brings tremendous benefits and offers solutions to our greatest challenges. In the United States, cancer remains one of the leading causes of death. Every year, nearly two million Americans are diagnosed with cancer. That's roughly 4,600 people every day. One promising treatment is targeted alpha therapy using the rare medical isotope actinium-225. Targeting molecules bind to specific proteins expressed by cancer cells. A specific molecule will bind to a specific type of cancer. Right now, there are only a few sources of actinium-225 to support continued advances in this important medical research. This is where nuclear innovation comes in. A partnership between TerraPower and DOE contractors will allow us to provide high-quality, life-saving material to the radiopharmaceutical research community. More actinium for drug makers can enable clinical trials and jumpstart a viable market for treatment. Terra Power Isotopes is joining a vibrant radiochemistry research presence in the greater Seattle area, home to several world-class research and analytical testing facilities. American leadership in advanced nuclear energy research brings more than clean energy benefits. It has the power to save lives. Learn more at terrapower.com. To go to the terrapower.com website, and especially 
uh, several months ago, you would look at it and say they appear to be a company pursuing innovative nuclear reactor designs and, and concepts out there. And that's true. Um, but their, their founding came from a, a venture capitalist firm called Intellectual Ventures that a number of extraordinarily wealthy uh, folks had gotten together to put their money in for um, essentially good causes. And so TerraPower is, they refer to themselves as a double bottom line company where they're, they would like to make a profit, but they also want to do good. And that's where this idea of, of uh, saving the thorium-229 from disposal and being able to generate this actinium-225 came into play. Just as a side note, you can look at their website. I'm not disclosing anything unique. You'll learn that the chairman of their board is Bill Gates. So that gave us kind of a, a neat, we've yet to get them to come visit us, but keep hoping. <laughs> so to talk about, currently at, at Isotec, we started into glove box operations and it's part of the whole accelerated process to, to ultimately dispose of the U-233, but also to recover the thorium-229. So we started our first uh, glove box operations here in, in October. We've actually have processed six cans of material. Doesn't sound like much, but out of that six cans of material, we've extracted uh, nearly a quarter of a gram of thorium. We've extracted almost as much thorium as what Oak Ridge Lash National Lab currently has in hand. And so, and we'll continue on the path to ultimately keep extracting it and delivering it to TerraPower. But these are some photos that talks, this is kind of the real life pictures of what you saw in the video. It starts with our people bringing a can out of the 3019 storage tube vaults and moving it over to 2026. The cans that we're currently processing are low dose cans so our people can handle them in lightly shielded containers with extended reach tools and, and not have to have heavily shielded uh, containers to move the material. And so as you can kind of make out up there and look at that, we do it with stuff as sophisticated as a little cart to uh, safely haul it. It's literally hauling it across the street from one building to the other. Um, once they get it into the building, they then open up the can in glove box one. And in glove box one, they will dump out about half of the contents and that's the uh, oxide powder, gives you a shot there. So they'll dump out about half of that uh, into the batch cup and they'll move it into glove box two where is where we add the nitric acid, dissolve it, convert it into urinal nitrate and then run it through the two resin beds that uh, we showed in the video there. And in that second resin bed, it pulls off the thorium. Uh, our folks have had uh, uh, have uh, worked well and, and have achieved pretty high efficiencies in extracting the thorium. We're not leaving much behind, and, uh, and so we uh, keep working it. Once the, the, uh, urinal, the um, urinal nitrate's been run through the two beds, it gets the, what's left over gets dumped into a, a grout drum and it gets rocked up. It's a 55-gallon drum that now will be buried as low-level waste in, in Nevada. But the, the uh, thorium is now eluded off of the resin bed and taken over to glove box three, where it's then uh, dried in a water bath, and you end up with this very precious film of thorium-229 on a glass vial. And it's that that we then package up for a shipment to TerraPower out in Washington State. We've made five shipments. We have the sixth one ready to go. They'll be shipping it out in the very near future. And, and they're gearing up their facility uh, to start processing and, and generating the actinium isotopes in the uh, late spring, uh, early summer timeframe. I, I will share with you, um, when we presented this approach and doing the glove boxes to DOE, we set a hard line in the sand for ourselves and, and we said in uh, August a year ago we wanted to be processing a year later and, and we literally started in building 2026 with an empty room that used to have glove boxes in it. We didn't have any glove boxes. We went out and with, with uh, used Tennessee tool here in town and to go fabricate glove boxes for us and so in a year's time we outfitted the room with glove boxes, we qualified our operators to do the work. We went through the DOE requirements to start up a nuclear operation, and we were operational in September. Um, we took a little pleasure. We were sort of a 
good natured competition with TerraPower on who would be ready first. And, and I have to tell you that we, a DOE contractor, beat out a capitalist funded, uh, venture capitalist funded uh, entrepreneurial outfit. They, they were a little bit behind, but it, it's all in good nature. Our folks did a great job. You heard some reference in the other video to Thorium Express. That's what we called it. And you, you've seen some uh, uh, symbols of that. In the meantime, <laughs> This will allow us to address about 40 cans of oxide powder, and then, but we still need to get the hot cells retrofitted and put all the processing equipment in place to handle the more radioactive cans of the material. And so, while we've been doing the Oak Ridge oxide processing with our Thorium Express, we've had to get the hot cells ready. And so, we've been busy doing that, opening up the hot cells, taking out the old uh, equipment that is in there. We're in the process of replacing all the manipulators, and we're building the whole dissolution and downblending systems to go do the same thing that we're currently doing in the glove boxes, but on a larger scale, and to handle all the materials, not only the oxide powders, but the metal and the, and the RCPO6 ceramic monoliths that we have. And, and then just to give you a sense, we, we do our best to, to keep the money locally. And these are a number of uh, local firms that are building the equipment for us and providing services to get into the hot cell processing. As you can see, um, everyone from manufacturing sciences to, to alloy fab to protoserve, M M M MCL. Um, but we try to keep our money locally to benefit all the, all the companies around here. The, um, before taking questions, I'll also just share with you, one of the things we talk about is what makes us so unique, uh, we feel, in our mission in uh, environmental management is this idea of being able to, to leave a legacy. And so <clears throat> what we, we share, we have, I show at the end of all my all, uh, all hands, uh, this is our legacy. For the generations who follow us, the material things we work for now will not matter, but because we worked at Isotech to provide medical isotopes to those generations, <clears throat> the future will be brighter for all who fight cancer. So that's Isotech. Thank you for the presentation. Really interesting information. Um, I'd like to open uh, the floor up to the board members for questions for Mr. Bowen. Yes, sir, Mr. John. You said if I heard you correct, you said if I heard you correctly that there's like 500,000 doses at the, what, in what Oak Ridge stores? No, sir, so Oak Ridge Lab can generate about four to 5,000 doses of actinium a year, but they only have a quarter of a gram of thorium. We ultimately will deliver over 40 grams of thorium to TerraPower, and so the, they will ultimately be able, TerraPower will ultimately be able to make available a half a million doses of actinium for targeted alpha treatment. What, what happens uh, when that's all used up? How long will that take to use it? Thor Project thorium has a pretty long half-life. Now, in TerraPower's role, I will tell you the department um, in, in the science side is pursuing accelerator technology to generate thorium-229 for future such cases. So this is a supplement to uh, until the accelerator approach comes online. I'm not familiar with the whole timeline, but I do know the isotope office and DOE is, is working that initiative also. Okay, so there is, a, is another source that's being yes, developed. Right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mr. Baker. How long did the uh, process take from the thorium to the actinium? That I don't know. <laughs> you mean how long? Yeah. I, 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 extraction. So our extraction process from the time we bring a can into the glove box and we get the thorium is on the order of days, a couple days. doesn't take us long to do that. Now, how long it'll take TerraPower once they, they go into their glove boxes or hot cells with a thorium and generate the actinium, I think it's going to be on the same order. I mean, if I think about the fact that that uh, they will be generating thousands of doses a year, it, it has to be 
pretty quick. I mean, the, the actinium exists in the thorium inventory that we send them. I'm not an expert on their side of the business. So I, I guess I thought from seeing that it was like a process from one to the other, but you're saying you take it out, you do one process, then you do another later or something? So the, with the thorium that uh, TerraPower has right now and the additional thorium will ship them, they'll, they'll start up and they'll start generating the actinium for the medical researchers. They'll keep doing that, and in parallel, we'll be processing uranium-233 and extracting more thorium to send to them, and they'll keep expanding their, I'll call it a production line. And in fact, I, I would, to share with you, I've asked TerraPower, do you intend to do all of your, your isotope generation in Washington State, and how would you distribute that around the country if you're talking hundreds of thousands of doses? And this is still years out. They, they envision maybe a, a, more, um, a more distributed manner. I've even said you might want to consider Oak Ridge down the line of putting a medical isotope generating facility and uh, working it from there. But they will probably, years to come, and it's going to, it will take them on the order of uh, several years to get up to that 500,000 doses per year range. It, you know, in years to come, they will need more facilities to do this. What's the exposure to a worker? I'm sorry, what's that? The average exposure to a worker. To our workers? Yes. Um, yeah. Basically, uh, zero is not, it's not zero, but it, it is well in the singular milliram range. Because the glove boxes are shielded. Okay. Um, I think for the first can that we processed, and Sarah, correct me, the doses to all the workers there, the collective dose was on the order of 10 milliram. EPD is an electronic personnel dosimeter, so, so they get a real-time reading. If they, they sign in on a radiological work permit, you know, and they start out at zero at the end of the job, they sign back out, and it says they might have gotten one milliram or a couple milliram. We, we long-reach tools, shielding, we have a variety of shielding around the glove boxes. When the workers were not in the glove box working, they, they stepped back or behind shielding just to constantly keep their exposure to the absolute minimum. And then the hot cells will be even further protection from the higher, uh, more radioactive materials that are in there. Thank you. Miss Andrea? correctly that you said that TerraPower was looking at two types of cancer right now? Well, there are multiple cancers that targeted alpha therapy has the potential to treat. Prostate, I've seen um, some results from clinical styles for prostate cancer, and, and they showed um, uh, x-rays or, or scans of before and after the treatment. It was, it was pretty remarkable. They, they've talked about their other cancers, bone cancer. Um, I, I forget the others, but there, there's um, a lot of opportunities. And I think it's going to—it's a matter, for what little I know, of the, the researchers picking the right protein that will go after that particular cancer cell. But what it's essentially doing, it's got the actinium, uh, I'll call it a hand grenade, <laughs> on that, mo that protein molecule, and it goes in, and, and the, the, alpha come, the alpha radiation coming off of the, the, the uh, actinium kills a cancer cell, but doesn't harm the surrounding uh, healthy cells. Okay. That was my question, too, was, you know, did they choose those cancers for a particular reason, or is that just what was working? That's what the researchers are going after. What no. TerraPower has looked at is they've recognized that the researchers can't get past these small <clears throat> clinical studies because they don't have enough actinium to really go after it. And that's where they were coming from. They said, to the department, you're about to about to bury the thorium-229, and we will lose that actinium forever. And we're willing to, to pay the cost of, a, of extracting it, the added cost, and that, so that we can make the actinium 
hundreds of thousands of doses available to the researchers so that they can take it from clinical studies to an FDA-approved treatment. So that's, that's where we get excited, is being able to help provide that materials to the, the medical community. Dave, do you have a comment? Yeah, I actually have a comment and a question. <laughs> um, the comment is I just want to make sure people understand why this project is so important to the EM cleanup program, you know, in addition to the opportunity in medicine and so forth. Basically, when you see the building on Friday, you'll see that it sits on top of a hill and it's surrounded by a security system that's similar to what Y-12 has, protecting their most right. secure facilities. It is, as Jim said, our oldest facility and it was used for all types of radioisotope separation activity. So there are a collection of basically process lines that come from that facility to other facilities down the hill because the operation of the facility way back before Isotec was there, there's been some releases to the subsurface there. So we have to get the building, the 3019 building, de-inventoried so that we can tear it down and start working from the top of the hill down to clean up the subsurface in that area. That provides the environmental benefit. Um, a second thing is that the security posture at Ornell is pretty much defined by the presence of this facility. But when you go to Ornell, these guys will make it easier for you to get in, but a lot of work goes into getting guests into Ornell. It'll seem, hopefully, pretty, pretty slick to you, but it takes a lot of work right now. And because Ornell is, has multiple user facilities that uh, researchers from around the world come to, we'd like to be able to do things that allow us to receive guests more efficiently. And once we get basically weaponizable material out of the center of Ornell, um, it's going to be a lot easier to do that. So my question, that was a long comment, <laughs> my, sorry about that, but my question is, uh, under current projections, and I know they can change based right. on budget, how long will it be before we expect to have cleaned out the 3019 building of the U-233 that you guys are focused we're, on? We're looking uh, into, it's into 2025, maybe as late as the third or fourth calendar quarter of 2025. There are some, um, we still have some future challenges. The oxide powder, pretty straightforward on, on how to deal with it. We have some other materials that in and of themselves, Dave's alluded to the security aspects. There's some other materials that in and of themselves provide a challenge that we still haven't uh, completely addressed on how do you deal with this, maintain the necessary security, and take something big and make it into a bunch of small pieces and dissolve it. So that's that's still, but that's why we're, our contract currently, for all we know, says the end of 2024, but in our discussions with, with our uh, project, uh, federal project team, we're saying we're probably into 2025. Thanks. Mr. Rudy. Um, how much longer will you be able to accept uh, the MSRE traps if they continue to, uh, you know, have those generated past your 2024, 2025 timeframe? Or that's a question for Dave. Dave, do you think they're going to have traps after that? <laughs> if it's a question for Dave, Dave doesn't know the answer. I'm, I'm sure there will be a plan in place well before we face that challenge. So in other um, words, basically, you'll be able to accept those, and then after they're gone, what's going to happen with the traps after that? Nathan, do you know the answer to that question? Yeah. Go ahead and answer. Not really, we won't need the traps anymore based on the new system. That's so your, RG, your RGRS system is... Going to be going away. Well, it, it'll be modified significantly. Uh, Bill had a Bill had a previous presentation on this, and you could probably pull it up. The last one we had here talked about those improvements to uh, MSRE. So ideally, we won't have to have traps. Okay, so your NAF traps and RGRS traps are going to be going away, then based upon your current projections, correct? Yes. Okay, so basically that answers my question, but. You still uh, do, you, do you have any in the inventory that you're going to have to send them? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, sir. Miss Harriet. I kind of look at this from the point of view of a, an educator. People are 
Where does the training come from for the people who actually carry out these processes on a day-to-day -day basis? Where do you get your employee force? So um, we, we tend to hire our employees from um, competitors, if you will. You know, it's it's so that uh, in-house we get some folks that have come from Y12, some from come from TWPC. Um, we have operators that and supervisors that have come from MSRE in many years ago, joined ISOTEC. Uh, we will get, um, we'll get RADCON technicians that uh, have come from uh, either the DOE environment or from commercial nuclear. And then we have our own um, certified training plans to train up the operators in-house to be fissile material handlers, to be manipulator operators. So we have a, our training program is approved, is reviewed and approved by DOE, meeting DOE requirements. And so it has to, to meet those. Same with our RADCON techs, they have to qualify as uh, uh, RADCON technicians, again, under an approved training program. Mr. Bell. chemistry, is thorium a naturally occurring element? There are isotopes of thorium that are naturally occurring. As one there of these other sources the, of it besides? Well, this, the, the, the particular thorium that we have, thorium-229, is only man-made. It, it occurred because of, of uh, it comes from the decay of thorium or of uranium-233 is where thorium-229 comes from. So this particular isotope of thorium is a man-made source. Which, which decays to the actinium that will be used in the treatments. Do we have any guests this evening that have a question? Uh, sure. you, yes, I'm Roger Macklin. I work with the Tennessee Division of Radiological Health. Uh, I did my master's research out at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and my father worked there for many years in the neutron physics division. And he had a, a postdoc come over from Australia back in the 80s, I guess. And that fellow was like nine years older than me, so we became good friends, and we all, with my dad, went canoeing and hiking and all kinds of stuff. When he, um, Mr. Barry Allen, Professor Barry Allen, returned to Australia, he started working in uh, boron neutron capture therapy for cancer research and eventually moved on into targeted alpha therapy. At the time that the DOE program was being shifted over to EM, and it looked as if uh, I think Congress had basically said, you can't spend any money but for disposal. And I, I communicated, with, uh, I've stayed in touch with him and communicated with him. And he was at the time the uh, president of the International Organization of Medical Physics. Uh, there was public comment period and I asked him to draft a letter to Brian Demonia of DOE regarding uh, getting the thorium-229 available for cancer research, the, if I recall, the DRE response was something like, well, maybe if Sloan Kettering Memorial Cancer Center in New York City came forth with the money, then we could do something. And uh, the letter from uh, Dr. Allen mentions uh, the different types of uh, highly promising phase one clinical trials that we're doing for melanoma, leukemia, glioblastoma, which is brain cancer, and lymphoma. They planned new trials for pancreatic and prostate cancer. And it seems that if, uh, if anyone is interested, I have some more copies of this letter, and I would like to have one put in the record if there is that possibility. But certainly, uh, I commend Isotec and Terra Power and DOE for accomplishing this rather than putting it all in the ground. Thank you. Luther. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, Luther Gibson, former board member and contractor employee. Um, I know the defense nuclear, th this thing's got an echo or something in it. Uh, 
All right. Um, the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board reviews your operation pretty closely. And uh, uh, on October 7th, the board sent a letter to, to the Secretary of Energy stating that, that the accident analysis used in the building in 2026 preliminary documented safety analysis used a different release fraction value than recommended in the DOE handbook, and, and that might result in a, um, an accident analysis uh, consequence that was not conservative. Did uh, did you all get that letter, and do you recall having to address that? We did, and we received the letter, and, and we addressed the uh, technical basis for the analysis that we did, and and um, and uh, DOE has agreed with the approach that we've taken. Um, the Defense Board has presented a, um, an extraordinarily conservative uh, view, but. Uh, what we've presented still maintains the safety envelope of the facility and keeps the workers safe. Uh, let me tell you, on that, on that particular issue of using bounding um, release fraction values, they're, they're pretty dogmatic about that. I worked at Y2O and ran into that too. Right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm Bob Hatcher. I'm a resident of Oak Ridge. I have a question just regarding the, the process itself. It seems like you're working on a relatively small scale to be able to do what you're doing, glove box scale. Is there, how did you decide on working on that scale rather than trying to scale up to, in terms of engineering and that sort of thing, to be able to process more material over a shorter period of time, and therefore uh, finish the project more quickly? Or you decide on a particular scale at some point then? We, we, st we actually, our scale started with when we looked at the processing through the hot cells. And in their, um, to increase the, the, the uh, scale of it would involve bringing more material into the facility. And it brings along with it two major uh, challenges. One, more material means we have to change the security posture of, the, of 2026 to look like 3019, okay. which drags a lot of cost and effort. The other part was uh, the from a safety basis standpoint and the controls that if you try to get into a large production system, uh, it might uh, it would cause us to design uh, systems and controls that would add cost and not necessarily, maybe while in production would go faster, but to get to that point was going to take us longer. We deliberately chose a laboratory scale approach uh, many years ago in our conceptual uh, uh, design of this and going through the uh, critical decisions we presented. And so in the hot cells, we will only bring over one can of material at a time. Mm. And when we open it up, we will only empty out about 250 grams of, of fissile material, dissolve that, process that before we process another. Now, we will have two sets of uh, hot cells uh, set up to handle it, so we can, can do that. But um, it's really to keep, frankly, to keep the material at risk to the, the minimum necessary size without, from security standpoints and safety standpoints. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Rudy. Uh, yes, sir, as a point of reference, you said what the, uh, what the dose of the workers was receiving. As a point of reference, compare that to how much is actual, you know, quote unquote, allowable within the DOE concept. So under our program with DOE, we first set an administrative control limit to our, our uh, nuclear workers at 500 millirem per year. And we have, uh, we've looked at if we're in situations, if we need to go above it, there are steps to go above to get approval. I mean, the, the federal guidelines allow 5,000 millirem to a worker, but you know, through DOE measures and programs, we keep it, it starts at 500. And you're seeing how much there? Uh, the, the first processing operation was on the order of, among all of the people, the collective was, uh, I think, on the order of, of 20 to 30 millirem. I don't remember the number. I just know it was small. And that's not per, for one person. That was among three operators, the supervisor, and two uh, radiological control technicians. So an individual might receive maybe two to three. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. As a point of reference. Right. Yeah. 
Thank you, Mr. Boland, for your time this evening. We appreciate you. And I'd like Thanks. to open the public comment period. Shelley, do we have anyone who's signed in? Okay. Please use the microphone and state your name. Please keep your comments to three minutes. In a former board member and retired contractor employee, um, I did old comments I made at previous meetings. It's now been 225 days since the M Consolidated Business Center announced and is still announcing that a draft request for proposal for the Oak Ridge Environmental Cleanup contract will be issued within 15 to 16, 15 to 60 days, sorry. Uh, another thing, at the executive committee meeting last week, I, su I suggested that a half-day workshop be considered for the ETTP main plant groundwater feasibility study. It's a very complex study, and, and, and the scope that is separate from the other zone two decisions is, is difficult to focus upon, not to mention the tendency we have in these discussions to interject groundwater issues uh, that are on and actually going off other parts of the reservation. Uh, a board presentation and then a committee meeting that is basically a makeup session for the board meeting is, is not enough to give that topic justice. So uh, I think it's coming up in June, we might, might consider some time in that time frame, or at least before the proposed plan comes out. Um, this is also one of the decreasing opportunities, uh, a decreasing number of remaining opportunities to consider the implications of what long-term stewardship is going to look like at ETTP. Okay, and then on Monday, the um, president's budget was released, and um, the numbers I saw in there was for the, uh, uh, the defense envir environmental cleanup. It, um, it, it went down from 450 million to 263 million, between 2020 and 2021, and the uranium enrichment D&D fund uh, is going from 196 down to 145. So we're basically talking about a $400 million uh, program versus a $600 million program again. And we know congressional appropriations process usually changes this, but a reasonable question still to ask is uh, whether those levels will require renegotiation of FFA milestones or not. I just thank you for pondering that. Go ahead, Dave. Thanks. Um, one, <clears throat> on the procurement process, of course, I can't speak to the procurement process because it's all procurement sensitive. But what I can say is that the process has fallen behind schedule. However, we do have plans to ensure that the work proceeds in an un un uninterrupted fashion. So we'll be OK. Um, on the groundwater thing, we will make sure that there are lots of ample opportunities for people to understand what we're doing in the feasibility study and we're not going to just wait to issue a proposed plan and then take formal public comment. We'll do it the way we normally do it with this group where we give all the briefings the group wants to understand what we're learning through the feasibility study. And the last thing, were you referring to the president's budget? Uh, yes. Yeah, so that's always a challenge. Um, you know, at any given time, we're working on three budgets. We've got the budget that Congress has already given us, which in the case of this year is very ample. We got the U.S. Department of Energy's Oak Ridge Reservation is the site of a vital national defense facility and a modern computational and scientific center. But over the years, parts of the reservation have been contaminated with radioactive and other hazardous waste. DOE has been busy cleaning up those affected areas, but much remains to be done. Citizen input is a valuable part of that effort, and DOE welcomes advice from the Oak Ridge Site-Specific Advisory Board, a citizens panel that provides independent advice and recommendations on DOE's cleanup of the Oak Ridge Reservation. The board provides input on a wide range of environmental cleanup operations underway at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Y-12 National Security Complex, and the East Tennessee Technology Park. You can be part of this important work by attending the monthly meetings of the Oak Ridge Site-Specific Advisory Board. For more information, call or visit our website.